Hello everybody, my name is Jeff Janess, and today we're going to talk about basic GIS concepts, which, you know, what is GIS in general, and we're going to look at ArcGIS in particular, which is one of the main GIS packages out there. And first off, you know, we all know that paper maps are great. They show where things are, they often let us estimate simple things like sizes and distances. In forestry, we know better than most how important a good map can be. And I assume that all of you are familiar with topo maps. We've all seen these. We know how they can estimate distances based on the section lines. You know, a section is roughly one square mile. We know how we can estimate elevation at any point just by looking at contour lines. And you know, if there's any drawback to these paper maps is that the map only shows what the author wants to show. We don't really have a lot of flexibility. We can see what somebody else decided to show us, but not necessarily what we are most interested in seeing. So this topo map doesn't show our project area unless we draw it in manually. Now, GIS goes much further. You can adjust the map to more precisely fit your needs. So for example, I want to show the burn severity across the wall of fire, and I don't want to be distracted by extraneous lines like section lines or topo lines. I want a second map where I can see where the wallow is on the larger landscape. And I only want broad shape and national boundaries on that second map. I can design this final map to be exactly what I want, and GIS lets us do this. Now, it's great to be able to do this, but truly this is the least powerful thing you can do with a good GIS. Now, another example, the Museum of Northern Arizona has this plateau magazine that comes out periodically. We wanted to show the greater Flagstaff area and where it's set within the Rio de Flag watershed. And we only wanted to show particular things like the shape of the landscapes, major drainages and streams, and a few important locations on the landscape that are mentioned in the magazine. So GIS lets us create this thing exactly the way that we want. GIS goes a little further, and one of the best things is that most GIS data have attributes associated with them. You can not only see where things are, but you can get extensive information about what they are. And this is where we get the name Geographic Information Systems. You can get information about individual features, we can identify areas that meet some complex set of criteria, and we can generate new data to describe the areas that we care about. It gets really fun when you start trying to find places based on complex sets of criteria. This example shows a region around Lake Tanganyika in Central Africa, and this was part of a project I did with the Food and Agriculture Organization a few years back. We wanted to provide tools to developing countries that would let them analyze the landscape in interesting ways. And so, for example, if we're going to build a factory, we might be concerned about the effects of a toxic spill into the watershed. And therefore, we want to be able to find out what areas are downstream from that factory. Alternatively, we might detect some pollution in the watershed. In this case, we want to know what is upstream of that area. And so we can use a GIS to identify this area. Now, could be a more complex analysis. Suppose we build a fish hatchery at this spot. If we have a spill out of that fish hatchery, well, the fish could all swim downstream through this red area, but they could also swim upstream from any downstream point. And therefore, we need some easy way to identify this entire larger watershed region. The GIS is ideal for this. We also sometimes want to select areas by some complex set of criteria. Here we have a port off the coast of Morocco in northern Africa, and we want to identify where people can fish, and there were three constraints that mattered here. First, there was a legislative constraint. People couldn't fish within six kilometers of the port. That was just the law. Secondly, there was a fuel constraint. They couldn't fish further than 20 kilometers. And then there was an equipment issue where they couldn't fish in areas deeper than 200 meters. So based on those three criteria, these areas here were the potential fishing zones. And these kinds of complex multi-criteria constraints are pretty common. And we're going to cover how to do this type of selection later on in the class, but you know, there's just preview of coming attractions here. Now, of course, you can go further than just selecting data in ArcGIS. You can actually create new data sets that classify the landscape into different criteria. And this is an example called the Recreation Opportunity Spectrum. Here's another example of finding areas by complex criteria. And lots of ways to find the shortest route between locations these days. 
Now, identifying the shortest route actually requires a fairly sophisticated GIS analysis. It's pretty exciting that so many sources give it to you for free these days. Google Maps, for example, uh, Apple Maps will do this. And this example shows the shortest route between the NAU School of Forestry and Beaver Street Brewery, which is something that I've cared about. And notice there are options to find the shortest path by walking, biking, and driving. Now, Google Earth, Google Maps, MapQuest, these are all simple GIS systems. And if your GPS can tell you the best route to take to some location, then it is also performing a GIS function inside. It gets fun when you start using GIS to analyze complicated spatial relationships. And any question that depends on location is potentially a GIS question. In this example, we were worried about wave energy that hits at some location. And specifically, we we're trying to figure out how uh, coral reefs would react to wave energy. So wave energy is a function of wind speed plus the distance of that wind over open water. And the white lines here represent the observed wind directions. So the GIS question is to calculate the what we call the fetch distance. This is the distance that the wind is allowed to blow over open water. Another interesting Part of this analysis was that we wanted to exclude reefs that were smaller than some threshold size. You know, the reef could block the wind and the wave action, and but if it's a small reef, then we don't want to have it blocked. And so in this case, size is defined by the visible arc of the reef on the horizon. It's not the actual size in acres, but just how much the horizon it covers from your perspective. And smaller reefs have a larger arc if they're closer to the point. And that means in this case, uh, Reef A actually was considered to block the wind and wave action, whereas Reef B, even though it's larger in acreage, has a smaller arc on the horizon, and therefore we did not use it to stop the wind and wave action. And of course, GIS is also good for analyzing the shape of the landscape. We can identify hills and valleys. We calculate slopes and aspects. Lots of different ways to calculate and estimate the ruggedness of a landscape. And then there's the curvature, which kind of tells you whether water, if water flows over it, does water accelerate or decelerate as it flows over it? Or does water sort of diverge or converge? Curvature is good for a lot of things. You can classify the landscape in a variety of different ways. In this example, we're classifying by what we call slope position using something called uh, the topographic position index. For this analysis, we first calculate the slope from the DEM, the digital elevation model. We can then use both the DEM plus the slope in combination to define ridge tops, valley bottoms, etc. And even better, we can make this sensitive to scale, so we can do it at different scales. And this lets us find, a, say, for example, a ridge top down at the bottom of a valley. And it lets us analyze uh, the way different phenomena might perceive the landscape, so that a, a cougar would probably perceive the landscape at a different scale than a mouse, and you can analyze the landscape accordingly for those different animals. We can generate statistical surfaces. This is what we call a Mahalanobis distance. It defines the landscape in terms of how similar any point on the landscape is to some ideal combination of variables. So, for example, in this if we had a bunch of spotted owl locations, and at each spotted owl location, we knew the slope and the elevation. And based on that, we can classify the entire landscape based on their similarity of, of slope and elevation to what the owls seem to perceive. And this is useful for identifying potential areas where the animal might be uh, found in the future. If you're going to survey for owls, then you might do something like this to identify the most likely places to survey. Here's another example of a statistical surface. And if you do the lab on wildlife analysis, you'll do this one. This is what we call a kernel density. It lets us identify areas where an animal seems to spend most of its time. Here's another example of a statistical surface, that same kernel density used with bald eagle analysis. We, were, we had some bald eagles with radios on them. And based on observations over time, we were able to see that these are the areas that the eagles seem to spend most of their time. Dr. Chambers and I used some of that same bald eagle data to see if there was any kind of bald eagle preference in terms of aspect of the landscape, so what direction the landscape was facing. And this is sort of interesting because uh, you know, bald eagles in Arizona are usually here during the winter, much more than the summer. And so these locations are mostly winter locations. And if you look at this chart, this is what we call a polar plot. 
it's similar to a typical histogram, but a histogram kind of bent around in a circle. So if you look at this on the left here, you see the this this is the direction the the landscape was facing where the eagle roosted each night. You see they roosted most often at roughly 33, 34 degree aspect, meaning that the landscape was facing sort of northeasterly most of the time when the eagles were roosting there. Now in the daytime, they could be flying, they could be perched somewhere, foraging anywhere. There didn't seem to be any particular trend of the direction the eagles were facing. They seemed to be facing in all directions pretty, pretty uniformly. But it was the nighttime where they seemed to be really focused in the northeast. And this was especially interesting because, as I said, they're winter residents here and they are roosting at night. And so at night they tend to be facing northeast, which is north facing slopes, the coolest, coldest part of the landscape at the coldest time of the day and the coldest time of the year. So they seem to be choosing really cool areas at night. Yeah, I don't know why. Maybe they, they prefer cool weather when they're roosting, or maybe it's just a habitat type. There was a different forest vegetation cover type there that they prefer. You know, it's hard to say. You can also do something called least cost path analysis. And here's an example where we're trying to figure out how to connect uh, wildlife patches. We have some area up here and down here that are protected areas. These are actually national forests down in southern Arizona. This entire region through the middle is likely to be developed and probably will be developed. But we want to figure out if, if there's any hope to protect a corridor that connects these two patches. Well, we can use this least cost path analysis to identify the biologically best habitat to protect. And we do this a lot when we try to find biologically best areas. But Honestly, more often, uh, what's biologically optimum is actually also where they are most wanting to develop. And so we'll use this area here as a baseline to compare to other alternatives. So the developer says we can maybe uh, protect this area up here. We can see if it's almost as good as the biological optimum. We can also use this type of analysis to determine whether the biological optimum is is actually even useful. Sometimes just because it's the best possible place to connect, it may not actually be good enough for the animal to use. So that's a quick discussion of some of the cool things you can do with GIS. And I just want to clarify real quick, uh, GPS is not GIS. A lot of people get them confused, but they're really not the same. A GPS, the Global Positioning System, this is a way that you collect data. GIS is the way you map and analyze that data. So GPS uh, is sort of the tool for collection. GIS is the tool for analysis and mapping. Now, sometimes your GPS receiver will have some basic GIS functions inside of it. So if your GPS will calculate the shortest distance from one point to another, well, it's doing a GIS function based on its own GPS coordinates. But truly, uh, GIS is a separate thing than GPS. So that's some highlights of GIS. And I think you're going to have a lot of fun once you start learning more about it. The tools are pretty interesting. They do amazing things. And in the next video, I'll introduce you to ArcMap, which is Esri's software. It's uh, one of the, the major GIS software packages out there. And uh, thanks so much.